Welcome everyone uh, to the second talk uh, in the seminar series on games and interactive media. It's my pleasure to introduce today's uh, speaker, Dylan Arena, who has a long history deeply rooted in Stanford actually. Um, so he did his undergrad here, his bachelor in symbolic systems. Then he went to Oracle as an application engineer for four years. And then he came back to academia before going out again to industry. Um, so he did uh, a master's in philosophy and statistics and then did his PhD in learning science and technology design uh, together with uh, Daniel Schwartz. And he worked a lot on game-based learning, how we can assess uh, learning in, in games, but also how um, games lead to future learning and uh, a number of other interesting things. And then he basically wanted to stay on an academic track, but then got lured uh, into this company, uh, Kadaptive, which he actually co-founded. And uh, he will give us his primary motivations, uh, presumably why he thinks it's better to, to be in uh, an industry than in academia. But it's great to have someone who can really do both and who can really do what we, um, or bring what we do in academia in, into the real world. So it's my pleasure. Thanks, Ingmar. I want to talk about Hodu English. That's the main point of the talk today. But I also want to talk a little bit about how we came to be in a position to be dealing with Hodu English. Um, so I'm going to start with the past. As Ingmar mentioned, my co-founder PJ uh, ran an animation studio, made beautiful things, and wanted to make beautiful things that helped kids learn, but he didn't know anything about learning. He knew about animation and storytelling. So he came and found me because his college roommate's sister was a friend of mine, um, and he talked to me about the possibility of creating something beautiful and engaging that would help little kids, like preschool type kids, uh, get ready for school. And I was, I was swayed in part by how beautiful the stuff that he made was. Because when I was a grad student, I was making like, my own graphics using Paint, you know, that default program in Microsoft Windows. Uh, and they were ugly. So to be able to make beautiful things was really cool and, and sort of empowering. And to be able to build something that millions of kids would engage with rather than just like a couple hundred, whoever you could scrounge up for your study, uh, was also um, very exciting. So, I left academia and I co-founded Kadaptive uh, a bit over four years ago. Our first series of products was called Leo's Pad, and it was a series of interactive animated games and stories for preschool children to play on their own or with their parents. Um, and the main goal for Leo's Pad was to cover a lot more than the ABCs and the 123s that a lot of parents think are what matters to get their kids ready for school. It turns out that's not actually that important. Um, preschool teachers and kindergarten teachers want to spend a lot more time working on a bunch of other growth areas rather than the sort of blocking and tackling of ABC and 1, 2, 3 and that kind of stuff. Um, so a big part of our mission at Cadaptive was to help parents understand that and to help kids get opportunities to explore those other important learning areas. But our long-term vision was broader than that. It was and is to create an ecosystem that supports all of the really cool ways that kids can engage with learning relevant content and capture those experiences, capture evidence of learning from all of those experiences. Because right now, kids can do all sorts of cool things, but every one of those cool things is an isolated experience, and it doesn't contribute to any larger body of information about how that child is developing. So we sort of thought of each of those individual little things as a tile. On its own, it doesn't do very much. But as you guys know from the tiles over at Memchu, if you can put them all together, you can make really cool pictures. Um, so our, our sort of motivating metaphor is a mosaic. And we're trying to build the technology infrastructure to support that mosaic. Now, it, the first phase of that process was for us to build our own products and to show that continuous embedded assessment was a thing that could work, that kids could be playing these games over time for months or years. And while they were doing that, their gameplay was helping us understand how they were developing in various important ways. And then we use that information to do two things. The first thing we do is we, we personalize the experience for the child. Because what a two and a half year old and a five and a half year old can do are very, very different. And what one three and a half year old and another three and a half year old can do are very, very different in different areas. So um, Leo's Pad is an adaptive set of games. And that's made possible by our psychometric engine that I'll talk more about in a minute. The other thing that we do is we use the insights that we gain from the student gameplay to give personalized tips and recommendations <coughs> to parents about how they can support their child's learning at home, in the car, at the grocery store, not in, not in digital ways, but just by having conversations with their kids or playing certain games or challenging their kids in certain ways. So again, phase one of our company was to build some stuff that showed that that was possible, some proofs of concept. So we have that. We have Leo's Pad. We have a companion app called Learner Mosaic, which is how we make those insights visible to parents. Phase two of the company 
is how we came to get Hodo English. Um, so I'm going to explain a little more about that in a sec. This is a diagram that one of our marketing people made to help people understand the adaptive learning platform. What happens is there's digital gameplay. There's also questions that we can ask parents about their children's experiences because a lot of things that are relevant to know about a child's growing, you can't figure out from digital gameplay. Like how Sophia holds a pencil is the example here. Or how well a child sits in place for a certain amount of time or delays gratification or can zip up his or her coat or wash his or her hands. So we ask parents questions. And those questions are sort of field agent observations that help us to, to triangulate where the student is with respect to various learning dimensions. Uh, then we, we sort of gobble that information up and we use it to update our model of the learner's progress along about 75 dimensions of learning. The visualization on the right is our representation of our early learning core skills framework. One of our design goals with that was to get away from this idea that there's like a bar that goes to 100 and if you could complete that bar your kid would be ready and better than other kids and all set and knowing everything they needed to know. Instead we wanted to help parents break away from that really strong urge that we all have to understand how our kid is doing relative to other kids and instead just say, this is where your kid is. Don't worry about where other kids are. This is where your kid is. And based on that, here's the right conversation to have with them at dinner tonight. Another benefit of our adaptive learning platform is we can look across cohorts of users and we can say, okay, so right now I have a two and a half year old girl who's just come into the system and I don't know much about her. I don't have much behavioral data. I don't have much observational data. But I do have previous cohorts of two and a half year old girls who have moved through the system and gone out as five year old girls. So I have a good sense about how this girl's trajectory might look on the basis of those observations. For those of you who understand psychometrics or statistics, we use a Bayesian IRT framework to do that kind of predictive modeling. So we gobble up other kids' models and those help us to refine our predictions about each individual learner. Learner Mosaic, as I mentioned, is the companion app. It's a free iPhone app for parents. And it tells them things that they can do. So on the left, you see examples about turn taking. We talk about where the child is with turn taking and we give the parent an option to explore ways to support that. In this case, it's a cooking exercise. Uh, you see the visualization of the mosaic and an example of a question we ask parents. So phase one of the companies, we build that stuff, we show the market and we show investors that it can work and it can produce real learning ga gains. Phase two is go out and talk to other people who make lots of really cool content and get them to plug into the platform so that it can be a real ecosystem. Because we don't want kids like just using our products all the time and we know that it's unrealistic anyway. What we want is for kids to be experiencing a lot of different things, a lot of different operationalizations of, of learning sort of operations and contexts. Uh, and we want to be able to knit all of those together to get a coherent and holistic sense of how the child is developing. One of the big companies we went to was a big company called NCSoft. It's a Korean video game company. And they mostly make massively multiplayer online role-playing games for grown-ups, like, like half-naked women with gigantic swords running around and killing everything in sight. Um, but they have a line of preschool apps. And so we were looking around at... <laughs> it's, it's weird, I know, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a sort of misfit. But we went there and we spoke to their senior folks about what our adaptive learning platform could do for their line of preschool apps. And the, the one of the, there were like 13 people around the table, but one of them was super, super sharp, kept asking wonderful questions. It turned out she had a PhD in artificial intelligence from MIT uh, and was really interested in our underlying technology. So then she came back to us afterwards and she said, okay, so we've got the preschool stuff and that's interesting, but we have this sort of skunk works project that we've been spending five years on. Uh, and we're a video game company, we're not a learning company. So for us to take it to market would kind of like be like Disney taking a textbook to market. You know, the market would be like, what? You're not the kind of person that should do that. Um, they had partnered with one company to help develop the curriculum, but they wanted to partner with us to bring the product out into the wider market because they understood that our adaptive learning technology could help that product be personalized. And because we had experience with parent feedback, we could sort of bring the parent into the learning sort of triangle with the child. Um, so. We talked to them about some kind of joint venture deal, but joint ventures, for those of you who are not sort of in the industry, um, which I wasn't until <laughs> recently, uh, a joint venture is like two companies kind of throw some interest at something and then they kind of do it on the side. But if you're a startup, you can't do anything on the side. You gotta just like do a thing. So we told them we gotta just do a thing. So if this is a thing we're gonna do, we can do it, but it's gotta be our thing. Um, so we ended up acquiring the game. Now that's what leads me to the whole point of this talk, which is that there's this really cool game that somebody spent a lot of time and money making and then we ended up having. We didn't build it. So we had, to, we had to come to learn about it. We had to study it. We had to figure out what was working and what wasn't working. And we had to figure out how we were going to design the next iteration of that game so that it lived up to the sort of high academic and performance standards that we have as a startup. And that takes me to the present. 
So I'm going to talk about Hodu. So um, this game has over 480 hours of gameplay content in it, which is just tremendously big. Um, most games, most massively multiplayer games have a couple hundred hours of content at most. Oh, don't tell me the window's too big. <laughs> I, I want to maximize it, but it won't let me maximize it. So a kid playing five days a week for an hour a day could play for about two and a half years before getting done with this stuff. Okay, fear not, I'm going to do the backup in which I explain all of the gameplay stuff instead of actually doing it for you. You guys are still here? Okay, so the, the main sort of mechanic in the story is you actually have conversations with characters in English. Um, and the reason that that's such, a, such an interesting approach for us is because in a lot of East Asian cultures, the kids get very good at studying for written exams that are really important high stakes tests that are gatekeepers for sort of higher education or jobs back in the West. Um, so they get really good at reading and writing in English, but, but the, the pedagogical system doesn't support speaking in English. Um, so these kids, they can ace the TOEFL and they can come to the US, but they can't actually have a sustained conversation in English. And so NCSoft recognized that and they decided to design a game that would let kids practice speaking in a really low stakes and low pressure contest, context. Um, they just have a little headset and a microphone and they talk to a computer character and if they say something goofy, computer character doesn't like laugh at them or you know, castigate them for not studying or trying hard enough. It just says, I'm sorry, can you say that again? So the kids love it. Um, and actually the, the, the first behavioral outcome that you notice in kids is improved pronunciation, but the first behavioral outcome that the parents notice is that the kids are just jabbering in English at home. And these are, these are uh, parents who don't speak English themselves. So they're like, I don't know what my kid is saying, but they're saying it in English and that's excellent and they get really excited. Um, <laughs> so the, the way the lessons work is they're all built around things called chunks. And a chunk is like a meaningful lexical unit. Like, yes, I would like that. Or what are you thinking? Or I can do that. Or let's go to the blank. So there are these, these sort of bits of language that hopefully you can kind of use and kind of fit together in interesting ways to make conversation happen. In the game, you are a linker. A linker is somebody who builds, maintains, and restores relationships. You basically go around and talk to people and see how you can help them. Um, sometimes they have disagreements with other people, sometimes they need errands run, sometimes they're just confused and they need you to help them with their homework or something. So the kids run around doing that and it's, it's based on these chunk cards. So, so you think Pokemon, these little playing cards. The kids get these chunk cards and then they have to go around practicing using that chunk, which is really just gamified drill and practice. Um, but it's an authentic kind of practice because they are actually speaking to use the chunk, right? They're using language to solve problems. So this is an example. You get a chunk card. Uh, it, Dino is your little sidekick dinosaur character. Uh, and he, gives you, he helps you find these chunk cards. In this case, the chunk is, what are you thinking? Which isn't like, what are you thinking? It's like, what are you thinking? You know, like, what's, in your, what's on your mind right now? I thought it was the former, and I thought that was a rude thing to teach kids, but apparently it's not. <laughs> um, so you, you, you first find the chunk. This is what's called a Punkmon, who's a little, little devil character. Oh, by the way, the big evil is the Devilmon. They come and they steal English out of people's heads. And it turns out it's because they want to learn English themselves. We didn't know that until very recently. Um, but, but basically, so these people have these clouds over their heads and they can't really communicate. And you help to restore those people's uh, language abilities. So you, you sort of beat up the Punkmon and you get the chunk card. And then you, you go into this weird, like, alternate reality anime battle situation in which like this, this, this character, Olivia Smithson, her, her normal avatar is like a sweet little brown haired girl and then she gets this like long flowing blonde hair and like cool like sunglasses and she can shoot lasers and stuff. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very Korean game. Um, <laughs> so this card is the, the pictorial representation of that chunk. What are you thinking? Like what's on your mind? What's up? And this little prompt here, this is, you know, speak. So the kid actually says, what are you thinking? And when they do that, they... Uh, gain Lu energy, which is kind of magical energy that they can use to fuel these attacks. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Uh, another example of what you can do is, what's the appropriate response here? I'm so glad you're here. What should I say? I am happy too, or yes I am, or good morning. So the kid has to sort of choose from a couple of options what makes sense in context to say. 
Um, there's also a travel report. After you have one of these adventures, you sort of write it down in a, in a linker book, like a log book of your activities. This is actually partly, I think, um, a pitch to parents, because parents want to see workbooks. Uh, they want to see, like, my kid practice something and I have sheets. So the parents can actually print out these travel reports. Basically, all the kid is doing is selecting from drop downs or typing something in. There's an example later where you type something in. Um, in this, we are helping this character who's like a rapping grandma to pick the right blingy headphones for herself. Um, so it, it gives you these, these opportunities to like read menus or look at catalogs or make choices based on calendars or schedules or timetables for catching trains. So it, it, it puts you in context in which you kind of are going to use English in an everyday setting, although with a little fun twist. Um, this is one where we're helping a police officer actually who's terrible at basic arithmetic. Um, <laughs> You, you sort of check his work and you tell him, hey, you know, you got it right or you didn't get it right. Um, this one I don't really understand. An orange is like a strawberry in the same way that I think maybe a cucumber is like a carrot. Um, but it's much more about analogical reasoning than just straight vocab. But you, I guess you got to know that a cucumber is a kind of sort of garden-y thing. So that's an, a sample of the kinds of activities you do in Hodo English. Now, my, my startup, um, we have... We have seven PhDs on the team uh, in the US office of about 20 people. So like a third of us are PhDs. And then the Korea office has about 50 people, and none of them are PhDs. Uh, a couple of them, three of them, have backgrounds in, in teaching English. But they're basi they basically, like, we make awesome video games. That's what they do. So all the learning stuff, that's on us. So we take this product in, and we have to make it our own. And that's what I hope to focus on for the, for the remainder of the talk. Um, the first thing we wanted to focus on is the curriculum. They had co-developed the curriculum with uh, an after-school tutoring company called Chungdam Learning, and they had, they had focused on this idea of chunks. Um, so we went to the research literature, because we're nerds and that's what we do, and we, we learned that task-based language learning or task-based language teaching, or TBLT, that is actually um, sort of best practice. So that was good, because task-based learning is at the center of what Hodu does. This is from their own promotional materials. Task-based learning is like right there at the heart of their pedagogical approach. So that's good, but it's really hard, and it, this is true for all educational game context, it's really hard to take something that you know pedagogically to be sound and to turn that into an engaging game mechanic that, that sustains the useful parts of the pedagogical approach and doesn't taste awful. Um, it's, it's what's called the chocolate-covered broccoli problem in educational games research, and it's, 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 it's not something like you know about it and then you avoid it, it's just a constant threat. So in this case, they know that task-based learning is good. So they put these kids in contexts where they're out to do things, to solve problems, to accomplish things in the world using language as a tool. But then there are these other things that look a lot like flashcards and drill and practice and sort of procedural fluency building stuff that isn't really about using the thing you're supposed to learn to do something that you care about doing in the world. Um, a second aspect of our curricular work has been to align what Hodu does with the curriculum offered by Cambridge English. Um, and this is something that I didn't know until like a year ago. Cambridge is a university in England, and it's a big famous university, and so people from all over the world want to come there. And so at some point, Cambridge said, well, we've got to be sure that these people understand English well enough that they can learn. So they developed these assessments that became sort of part of an entrance exam to Cambridge. And they were very successful, and then other schools started using them. And then the Cambridge exams got to a point in Europe that's kind of like the TOEFL is in the US, where it's sort of a de facto gatekeeper for higher education study in the region. Um, so Cambridge has these wonderful assessments that, that help kids, from the little kids, like, like seven years old, all the way up to taking their, their high stakes tests. Um, by the way, Cambridge assessment is also the group that does the A levels, which you might know about because Harry Potter had something like him. He had the owling test or the ordinary wizarding level tests. That's, that's like a sort of satire of the A levels, which are kind of like APs uh, in England. So Cambridge English has this assessment, has this curriculum, but they don't have um, their own instructional materials, really. They've just sort of got these tests. And they were really interested in getting into the space of technology-supported learning and adaptive learning, so they came and visited us, and we talked, hey, we have actually just acquired this product that helps kids learn English, and you guys have a test about English. So maybe we could make our product so that if you do well in the product, you can expect to do well in the test. Um, and actually, brief call back to my academic history. I worked on next generation assessment, and one of, our, one of our sort of pipe dreams was eventually you get enough ecologically valid measures of what a kid can do in the world that you sort of don't need to bring them in and sit them down and put them you know, in front of a drop-in-from-the-sky test and demand maximal performance to get a, a measure of them, right? 
Um, an example that a mentor of mine, Jim G, often uses is, if a kid has beaten the video game Halo, it would be redonkulous to sit the kid down and give them a test on Halo. Like, they beat Halo, so therefore they're a master in Halo. A goal for, for those of us who design educational context is create the context so that making it through the context means you have it. You have what you need. So one of our long-term goals with Cambridge is going to be to make it so that the gameplay is so highly predictive of performance on these tests that at some point we might be able to say, let's just certificate those kids. You know, you are a young mover or a young learner of English. They got movers, starters, movers, and flyers. Um, and those are low-stakes exams. So it's not like anybody's going to cheat on how to English to get into Cambridge. But it'll be a way of acknowledging that the gameplay is a valid measure of what the child is learning. From a psychometric perspective, it's interesting to think about using longitudinal typical performance to replace one-time high-stakes performance. Okay, um, so this is a nice paper prototype that our game design team has been working on to help kids with task-based language learning and aligned with Cambridge English. Cambridge has part of its curriculum that's about animals and part of its curriculum that's about tenses and places around the house. So in this game, it's a card game, there's a, there are a bunch of animal characters and there, there are four time periods. There's future, present, recent past, and distant past. And each player in the game is given a sort of win condition. And the win condition is a set of statements. Like the alligator had washed itself, the monkey will play on the roof, the lion is roaring, and the penguin was sleeping in the bedroom, or something like that. So you've got this set of sentences that you want to make true. So you want to uh, manipulate the game board so that your win condition is met before other people's win conditions are met. To do that, you have to manipulate the, the characters. You have to say, okay, well, I got a crocodile card. That means I can move the crocodile. So I'm going to put the crocodile in the wash tub in the distant past so I can satisfy the statement the crocodile had washed herself in the bathtub. And the other players, can, they can mess with your crocodile. They can move their own things. Um, when kids play this game, they're just trying to win the game, and they're moving animals around, and it's all cute and fun. But they're also they're learning about the difference between you know, had done and did and is doing and will do. They're, 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 they're getting examples of these different aspects of tense. And they're also learning about various parts of the house and daily activities and the names of these animals in English. And they're doing so in a way that it doesn't feel to them as if they're practicing or, or sort of drilling or anything like that. They're just playing a game and having fun. They also happen to be covering important areas of curriculum. This is an example of the current design for uh, daily interactions in Hodo English. You can see it starts off with a chunk lesson. You accept the task. You go and find the little chunk mon and you beat him up and take the card. And then you do a bunch of little errands and you fill up the loo energy in the card. And when it's ready, then you have your, your sort of big uh, mastery of that card and celebration. And then you go on to the next lesson. It is a, it is a very railroaded um, cycle. The kid doesn't have much choice about what to do next. The next thing to do is the next thing that you're told to do by Dean of the Dinosaur. So you go and do the next thing. Um, the, the battle happens right at the beginning, so it doesn't really have a lot of consequences. It's just sort of like a thing that you're expected to win so that you can get the card. And the, the little tasks that you do to fill up your Lou energy, they don't seem really related to the overarching game narrative of sort of fighting off these evil devilmon. So our game design is taking a look at that too. Um, one of the things that we tried to achieve is give the kid a lot more choice about how they achieve the goal. So there are a lot more paths to get to the, the, the end of the lesson. We also wanted to make the battle more consequential. We wanted to make it feel like a boss battle, like you got to do this and there's a chance you'll fail, but if you, if you win, then you will have sort of conquered that card, mastered that lesson, etc. cetera. Um, we don't yet have a great solution to the fact that the individual story quests don't interact tremendously well with the overarching narrative. And I, I mention that because it's an example of the kind of constraints you always got to work with. In this case, we've got over 300 voice actors who recorded tons of voiceover. And there are all these American folks who you, like, went to LA because you wanted native speakers, right? So they are all recorded. The, story, the stories are all scripted. The animation is all done. And to sort of rework that, to rip that all out and build something else would be tremendously expensive and time consuming. So we're working within the constraints that are set for us by the fact that we've inherited this wonderful game. Um, another aspect of game design that we want to improve is the pedagogy. So I, I, I sort of alluded to this earlier. In the battle, you, you do a thing, you use language in some way, and then that lets you shoot magic spells. But there's sort of no relationship between the way that you're using language and the kinds of things that are happening in the battle. It's just, it could be anything. It could be like 
you use language in a way and then, then you get an animation of a little person running around the bases in baseball. So it's what's called in game-based learning literature um, extrinsic or, or um, what's the opposite of what I want to say? Not intrinsically integrated. It's not even extrinsically integrated. It's just not integrated. Um, there is like a learning thing and a gamey thing and they're not really woven together. So what we're, gonna, what we're trying to do there, and this is just a preliminary um, prototype because that's what we're doing. We're doing a lot of iteration. Is you have this chunk. This is the phrase that you're supposed to master. So you actually have a conversation with the Devilmon to try to uncover their weaknesses. And that conversation is going to be scripted in such a way that it, that it requires you to use the chunk. And if you use the chunk well, you sort of find out. And in this case, our game designer said that one of them is like allergic to smelly socks, one of them hates toads, and one of them doesn't like ice water. Um, but whatever it is, you sort of, you can use language, and if you use it well, you'll uncover a weakness that will help you attack your enemy. And then in the second thing, the way you actually attack the enemy is you cast spells. And the way you cast the spells is you build sentences in English. So you're actually using language as the weapon. You're using language to accomplish your goal, not just to like get some sort of energy resource that you can use to you know, press a, mash a button and slash with a sword or something. Um, and then the third thing is, when the Devilmon attack you, they, they telegraph their attack by saying in English what they're going to do. And if, and if you can understand what they're going to do, like, I'm going to throw a bomb in the red area, you can sort of move out of the red area. And then you won't get hit. Um, so we're trying to make the battles more intrinsically integrated with the curricular goal of learning English. Uh, OK. There's a technical side of what we're doing as well. When the kid is talking, there's a speech recognition system that is parsing what they're saying and deciding whether or not it's a target utterance. Um, the problem is that there's a really high false negative rate in, in the data we've seen so far. So I should, I should also clarify, Hodu English has been used in a very limited release in a series of lab schools or, or tutoring academies in Korea. Um, so we do have data, gameplay data, from students who have used the current version of the system. Um, and you can imagine it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a computer center with a bunch of kids all talking loudly and video games being played. So there's a lot of noise. Um, and a lot of times the kid is saying the right thing and trying really hard to pronounce it correctly, but there's someone else who said something else in English. And the system can't differentiate between the two, so it, it dings the kid. And, and, and you can imagine how frustrating that would be, like, I'm saying the right thing, please. Um, so because we have access to all the audio files, we've actually heard these kids, and they're like, I said okay, or, or things like that, you know, or, or they're cursing, or they're singing Old McDonald's, or, or they, just, they, just, they just quit, right? Um, so we have a, a director of speech recognition who is a developmental psycholinguist who's been working to improve the speech recognition and, and sort of tamp down that false negative rate. Um, one of the ways to do it is simply to train a system on the kind of English that is spoken by those children, right? It's not the kind of English that most SR systems are trained on because it's not native speakers, it's not adults, so there are these high-pitched voices with kind of um, idiosyncratic differences in pronunciation that are going to depend on what their L1 is, what their, what, their target, what their native language is. So Korean children speaking English are going to make a set of pronunciation, um, not mistakes, but they're going to have tendencies in pronunciation that differ from those maybe of Chinese speaking children learning to speak English, which are different again from those of um, children from Argentina who are learning to speak English. So train the SR system using that particular L1 and children. That's one thing. And just doing that has helped uh, tamp down false negatives. And we also are going to try out this push-to-talk system. You know, like, here I am, and then you let go. So the system lets you say, now I'm ready, so listen to me, and now I'm done, so stop listening. Because right now it's just trying to be naturalistic, but that means if some kid coughs over here, it's going to think you started your utterance. And then if you're stopping for a minute to think about what the next word is or how to pronounce it, it might decide you're done and then try to parse that. So those two things. Um, have already, in some of our initial testing, brought down that false negative rate. There's also a really nice um, idea that our game designer had about using the, the environment itself to let the kid know when there's background noise. And this came up because we were on a conference call with the folks in Cadaptive Asia, and a, a police car went by, and we all knew that a police car was going by, so we all stopped talking. So we're going to be using something like that in the game. Um, the, the, the trees might rustle, or there might be like an in-game siren or something that just is an indication like, hey, there's a lot of background right, noise right now. If you tried to talk, it probably wouldn't hear you, so let's all just pause for a sec and then continue. 
Um, that's, I think, a nice example of keeping the kid immersed in the world, but letting them know about constraints that might impact their performance. Okay. Um, on the psychometric side, we want to make sure that all the claims that we're making about a kid's progress are fully warranted. This is an example of a child's accuracy when speaking a particular word. In this case, the word is question. And we can kind of see an upward trend, but there are a couple of, the, the ones that are marked out in red are ones where clearly there's something wrong. So I'm going to play them just so you get a sense for the kinds of acoustical data we're dealing with. Did you guys hear we have a porch guess? Porch guess is actually question. The kid is trying to say the word question, but doesn't know it. So got a low recognition score. Here's another example. Oh, he was maybe going to say question, but he paused because he's not sure about that word. And so the system cut him off and it threw it out. Uh, here's him like kind of nailing it. Uh, this next one is really loud. I have a question. There it is. Yeah, kind of, kind of like that. So it was a mic problem, but the kid is saying it well. And by the end, I thought, I think the kid is nailing it by then. Um, but we want, so in our data, we want to be able to distinguish the noise trials from the accurate trials. So, oh, now I can turn this all the way down. Okay, so we've got a machine learning model that takes a data set that has been evaluated by human scores. So a person listened to this and said, yep, the kid is saying what they're supposed to be saying, or like the kid is saying something badly and, and it's accurate, whether it gives a thumbs up or thumbs down, it's an accurate thumbs up or thumbs down, or it was noisy. So this is just a walkthrough of the way this model works. The very first thing it does is it looks at the word score. If the word score is low, it sort of puts it into one bin. If the word score is high, it puts it into another bin. If the word score is high, it is very likely that it's accurate. So that the false positive rate is really low. So the first cut is, did it get a really wor high word score? If so, 93% of the time it's making the right call. If the word score is really low, like lower than 0.42, about 90% of the time it's making the right call. Not, not a good statement. Now the, the, the noisy bit, the troublesome bit is in the middle, right in there. And then that, so I, I've sort of zoomed in on that part of the tree. Um, and then we were able to make a quick cut with the length of the phrase. If the kid is saying, okay, or yes, or good, and they're getting dinged for it, they have so much time to practice those words that it's really unlikely that they actually are saying those words incorrectly. Um, so 82% of the time in that case, it's, they got dinged falsely because of some kind of noise that interfered with them. In the case where um, it's a very short recording, then we know it's an early cutoff. 100% uh, of the time in those 16 cases, it was an early cutoff, and so it's not an accurate measurement. And then the rest of the time, this is where it's tricky, that, that far right area. It's about, it's getting it right about half the time, which is like just about as badly as you could do. Like if it's getting it wrong all the time, you could just flip it. Um, but it's just, it's in the really, that's where we have to do all our work actually. They're getting a low word score, but the surrounding, sco the surrounding word scores in the phrase are high. So you'd want to say, okay, they just boned that word. Like I have a pro progress or whatever that kid said. Um, but we don't yet know what to do in that area. So we're refining our machine learning to, to make better choices in that area. Um, and then the final area in which we're working is the, the parent feedback piece. This is an example of the parent feedback that parents got when the kids were in the learning centers where Hodu was previously available. Um, and it, as you can see, it looks just like what you get when your kid takes that standardized test. It's just a bunch of boxes and, and just noisy stuff and percentiles. And it doesn't give me as a parent anything that I can do. It doesn't give me anything useful to sort of hang on to. Um, so we're working to redesign it to tell a parent more about what a kid did. Like this week or this month or today or whatever, here's what your kid actually did. And part of that actually is to help overcome this fear that if a kid is having fun, the kid must not be learning. Um, we, we did a bunch of user research with both children and parents and the, the learning center operators before we acquired Hodu. And one of the things that the learning center operators told us was that they sometimes had to tell kids not to talk about how much fun they were having. Because if they did, the parents would think, oh, then clearly you must not be learning. And they would yank them right out. Um, one girl got yelled at by her mom because she said, I'm having a ton of fun. And her mom said, no, you're not. You're going to English class, so tell me what you're doing. She did not believe that the girl could be having fun and also be working on English. Um, so we want to help the parents understand, 
Your kid did things, like this is what your kid did. Your kid practiced how to ask others names and ages by asking questions like, who are you, how old are you? Um, encouraging sentences like, that's a good idea and how nice of you, how to say goodbye to friends, uh, comprehension stuff. Here are the phrases that they're practicing and sort of categorize those phrases. We want to make real for a parent what the kid is doing when they're playing the game and make the parent understand that it's not just messing around with a video game. It's actually useful, authentic English practice. Uh, okay, so that's it. So in summary, the areas in which we've been working to, to sort of improve Hodoo, it's already a wonderful product, but we got to sort of make it our own, you know? Um, curriculum, game design, speech recognition, psychometrics, parent reporting. And the very last thing I want to say, just as a tiny plug at the end, is we are a very research-focused company, uh, and we love to do collaborations with academics. Many of us used to be in academia, so we understand that, that one of the things that is in short of supply is participants. And we have many, 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 many users in the real world using our product for months or years. Um, with, our, with our previous product, Leospad, we've got kids who have been using it for two and a half, almost three years. Um, and we love to design little tests, little, little things that are experimentally useful to you to answer your theoretical questions into the product. Um, so, for instance, there was, there was a, a professor who was interested in the way, in, in sort of semantic association networks in nouns in like three-year-old kids. And her research paradigm was to show kids a whole bunch of stuff and see what they naturally group together. But that was a really costly experimental paradigm. It would have taken like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of kids to get any useful data. But we have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of kids, so we can design a fun little game that has the kids in, we were like making up stories or something, but the kids are given these random objects and, and we just were able to, to say, okay, how close a kid puts one object to another object when they're making this course sort of collage can be taken as some kind of indication of semantic relatedness. Um, and it, it was able to meet the researchers' needs because they got a lot of data that they could use to help them understand how these networks begin to develop. Um, and it was fun for us because, again, we're a lot of geeks and we like to help researchers do this stuff. And some of these insights can help us design our products in better ways, and that's also, of course, cool. Okay, so that's it. Mm -hmm.